just gonna wait a minute or so for all the participants to enter. Sure. So I'm going to get started. Welcome to the UDNF Peers book launch of the book Normal Broken, The Grief Companion for When It's Time to Heal, But You're Not Sure You Want to by Kelly Cervantes. My name is Christine McGarvey. I am the director of the UDNF Peer Tell Me More lecture series and the book launch series. I am also a UDNF Peer member. I am also a UDN participant and a mother of a UDN participant. I'm very excited about this book discussion that we're gonna to have today, as this book I think is a very valuable uh, resource to all undiagnosed and ultra rare patients and families. Um, even if you haven't lost someone, we've all experienced grief throughout our diagnostic odyssey I know personally I've experienced grief and the loss of a career. Um, and recently with my mother who was also undiagnosed and um, has had a rapid uh, decline. Um, so I think this is a valuable resource for all undiagnosed patients. After losing her daughter to uh, epilepsy, Kelly Cervantes knows that grief is many things. It's weird, it sucks. It's all encompassing, something everyone will have to deal with, but never linear. Just as what we are grieving varies, so do our journeys to process it. Normal Broken was born out of this desire to meet people where they are in their grief journeys, to lend a hand, or maybe just to sit in the dark with them, to acknowledge your brokenness and to feel broken together, never pressured to move on or to think positive. And today we are joined by the author, Kelly Cervantes. She's an award-winning writer, speaker, and advocate best known for her blog, Inch Stones, where she shared the stress, love, and joy that came with parenting her medically complex daughter, Adelaide. Since Adelaide's passing, Kelly has continued to write candidly about her arduous and at times contradictory grief journey. She has been published in the Chicago Tri Tribune, the Chicago Sun-Times, and Cosmopolitan, as well as quoted in the New York Times, CNN, and People. She is a current board chair for the nonprofit Cure Epilepsy and also hosts their bi-weekly podcast, Seizing Life, where she interviews scientists, doctors, and individuals affected by epilepsy. We also joined here by our moderator, Kimberly Bernardi. She is a licensed clinical social worker and has been a medical social worker for over 10 years, specializing in hospice, palliative care, and senior care. Currently, Kim is providing individual and group grief counseling services in her role as bereavement counselor with Mainline Health, Home Care, and Hospice. Kim's passion for companioning those through their grief journey is rooted in her diverse professional experiences in the medical and aging fields. Kim has worked alongside a palliative care team in the hospital setting having family meetings and initiating the hard questions about what is good quality of life. And just a, a little housekeeping, uh, if you have any questions and we encourage questions, you can type them in the Q&A section and we will um, get to them at the end of the book discussion. Again, I just wanna uh, thank both Kelly and Kim for joining us today and for discussing this very important recess, resource. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Christine, first of all, for that lovely introduction. And um, I'm so excited to chat with Kim. I wanted to start with just sort of sharing a little bit about my journey and connection to the UDN um, so that you understand why all of this is, is relevant and why I'm here today. So my daughter, Adelaide, um, I think probably a similar story to many, typical pregnancy, um, 
early uh, early infancy was fine. And then um, she uh, started showing signs of low muscle tone, difficulty eating. Um, she had her first seizure at seven months, diagnosed with infantile spasms at nine months. And from there, the symptoms just kept piling on. I believe we were accepted into the UDN in, let's see, she was born in 2015. I think we were accepted into the UDN in 2017. We visited the Duke site and did every test under the sun. Um, we would not find a diagnosis during her life. Um, in the spring of 2019, it was determined that whatever was causing all of her symptoms was neurodegenerative and um, but still no prognosis could be given. I hoped that we had years left with her, but in reality, we had months. She would pass away in October of 2019, just a few days before her fourth birthday. Um, two and a half years later, um, in the spring of last year, we did finally get what we think is an answer uh, from the UDN as to uh, a genetic condition, DEND 5A, um, that is most likely responsible. And that has brought some peace, um, I suppose, although that's um, maybe a stretch. Uh, so that is that is my connection to the UDN. Um, I wrote this book uh, on about my grief journey after losing Adelaide. Although so much of it actually it addresses a lot of the grief that I experienced during her life. Christine, as you mentioned, um, I, I had to quit my career uh, in order to take care of Adelaide. And that was, um, I, it took me a year to grieve my career and accept my role as Adelaide's caregiver, even though that turned out to be one of the most rewarding, uh, the most rewarding job I will ever have in my entire life. It was still a massive adjustment. Grieving all of the the milestones that she never made or we the regressions after making the milestones, um, grieving the life that I thought that we were going to have as a family before I was able to accept the beautiful life that we did have together, but there was a lot of grief in the middle there. And then really culminating in the loss of, of my physical daughter. And even then the number of threads tied to the grief. Yes, I missed my daughter. There are no words for how much I miss her every day, but I also miss being a caregiver to her. Mm -hmm. I miss um, the doctors and I miss hospital life. And I know that maybe sounds crazy, but I do because they became family. I, I miss the the ability to utilize so much of this knowledge that is swimming around in my head. I miss having syringes all over my house. I know it's um, it's complicated and it's contradictory and it doesn't always make sense, but that is what I hope that this book really is able to connect with people on, um, it doesn't make an assumption that anyone is ready to heal. I am not a therapist, so I, I, my angle is really to just come at this as a friend, as a companion, as someone who will sit in the dark with you and hash out the ugly bits and then maybe laugh about them after the fact. Um, so I am so excited to get into our discussion, Kim. Um, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Christine and Kelly. Um, and Kelly, you've already gone into just the very complex layers of grief, right? And all of the secondary losses that one experiences after such a profound loss and especially a loss of a child. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, in the book, you described how it's okay to not be okay through grief, yes. and also that it's okay to have moments of being okay. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think the idea of, you know, it's okay to not be okay is starting to become a more popularized idea. Um, that said, 
I still felt like certainly in my early grieving days and especially now, so I'm four plus years out from losing Adelaide and I will still come across people who want me to be better, who want me to be happy, who want me to go back to the person that I was before. And I now have the language and I now understand and I can explain that I'm never going to be the person I was when my daughter was alive. Losing her forever changed me just as Bef I am. I will never be the person I was before I was her caregiver, before she was sick, before she was born. These events drastically change who we were, and I can't go back to that other version of me. And so if someone is expecting that Kelly, then they are going to have to grieve her on their own because that Kelly doesn't exist anymore, and she has grown, and I think um, grown into a a stronger, more empathetic person. Mm -hmm. I love this person that I have grown into, um, even though that person is not always okay. And that person will grieve my daughter forever. Grief is not something that we get over. It is not something that we leave behind or forget because that's the most insane thing I, I have ever heard. I'm never going to stop loving my daughter. Grief and love are two sides of the same coin. So I am never going to stop grieving her. I'm never going to move on from her. However, I can grieve her and miss her and still find joy in my life. I can have moments where I'm not okay and then have another moment where I am. And mm -hmm. it took me years to come to a place where I was okay being okay. There was, there's so much guilt. So, and I felt this during Adelaide's life when she was, when she was not doing well, how dare I be happy when my child is suffering? How dare I allow joy into my life when my daughter is no longer here to experience joy at all. There is so much guilt that comes with grief. And what I will say is that I, it's okay to be okay, right? Like those, it is such a powerful statement, just as much as it is okay to not be okay, it is 100% okay to be okay and to relinquish that guilt and and these can exist simultaneously i we hear so much about like but and i feel this and i feel this and i kind of want to take that a step further i so we've um within the last couple of years we adopted um so not knowing what adelaide's genetic condition was having another biological child wasn't an option Mm -hmm. Um, and we were provided with an opportunity to adopt and it was something that I struggled with. And I imagine that it is similar to anyone who has a child who is ill and then has another biological child. And, and I, I, I felt like I was, I was worried that it would appear like I was replacing Adelaide with another daughter. And I felt guilty finding joy in the moments of our adopted daughter, Anessa, uh, in her life and experiencing that joy and celebrating that joy um, when Adelaide wasn't here. And the conclusion that I came to is that I can miss Adelaide. I can love her every day and be grateful for the moments that I had with her, period. Mm -hmm. I love Anessa. I love celebrating her love of dressing up and makeup and all of the crazy girly things, period. One doesn't have to have anything to do with the other. They can be separated by a period and coexist in my heart. And I can allow the not okay and the okay to live within me simultaneously. Thank you. That was so beautifully said. Um, and conversations I'm often having with my bereaved clients and grief counseling, um, you know, we often struggle with those feelings of, like you said, black and white thinking, either or it can't 
be both. And reality is grief is messy. Life is more complex than that. So thank you for sharing your experience, your lived experience of how to be okay and also not be okay. Um, I was wondering if you could go into more detail about some strategies that you have utilized along the way to help process your profound loss and grief of Adelaide. Yeah, I um, probably the strategy, the technique, the tool that I have used the most or the most successfully is writing. So there are all of these studies that have been done about how our emotions, when they are um, non-verbalized, when they are just living inside of us, they live in a certain part of the brain. The moment that we verbalize them, the moment that we write them down, we move them to another part of the brain where we can rationalize them. So they become less ambiguous and we can make meaning out of them. And they also just become a whole lot less scary. So, I mean, think about it. How many times have you heard someone or yourself say, oh my goodness, that was, you know, scarier in my head than it was when I said it out loud. It's that concept. So I actually wrote an entire 63,000 word um book, I guess, that probably no one will ever read about Adelaide's life. I just, I needed to document her entire life and the traumas and the joys and everything in between. And in doing that, I was able to work through so much of that medical trauma. I was able to work through all of these pieces that I was missing about her and about the life that we led together. And it is also this document that I can look back and reference. One of my biggest fears after Adelaide died was that I was going to forget pieces of her because that's human, right? We don't have these, you know, steel trap minds. Eventually memories fade over time. And when all you have left of your loved one is memories, that was the most terrifying thing to me at all of, of all. So to be able to write that down so that there is this document that exists that I can go back and reference that my son can, can maybe read one day and know what that life was like um, when he was a young child and his sister was alive. So writing significantly helped me. And also in, in my blog, writing the blog and being able to connect with people that way, I quickly realized during Adelaide's life that um, I'm not that special. And I, um, I don't, I, I am special in all of the ways that Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street taught me that I am, but I, um, but what I feel what I've experienced is not unique to me. Yes, the details are unique. The, my, it is my specific story, but there are so many people in the world who can relate to the macro version of what I've experienced and what I'm feeling. So being able to write that and share it with people and to hear someone else say, yeah, you know what? Me too. I felt like this too. You know what helped me? Have you read this book? You should listen to that podcast. All of these things, this the connecting mm -hmm. through my writing was incredibly beneficial. And then taking that connecting a step further, I it was probably about a year after Adelaide died and someone had messaged me and said, hey, there's this grief retreat for moms who have lost kids. And it looks like it might be, it's in New Jersey. I live in New Jersey. Um, and I um, was a couple glasses of wine in. And um, the next morning I woke up to an email that said, hey, we can't wait to see you at our retreat. And I was like, oh my gosh, what did um, two or three glasses of wine Kelly do last night? My mother, who was a therapist, um, was like, I think this is going to be great for you. I figured that it was either going to make for incredibly good writing material, or maybe I would actually get something out of it. And it turned out to be both. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a remarkable experience to sit with other, in this case, mothers who just got it. They just understood 
I remember there was, um, there was a woman and she was sitting on the couch and she was crying. And another one of the women just went over, handed her a tissue and held her hand. Didn't say anything. Didn't ask any questions. Just sat with her in her darkness. And I was like, yes, that is all so many of us want is just someone to hand us a tissue and hold our hand and sit with us and not offer advice, not try and pull us out of it, not try and make it better, but to just sit in that uncomfortableness. And then later that night, we're all sitting around a uh, fire outside and one of the moms brings out a, a speaker and we're listening to like 90s pop and R&B music and singing and dancing and like somewhere between Backstreet Boys and Belle Biv DeVoe, I was like, oh, I can like just let go with these women. No one is judging me. No one is, I don't have to worry about any of them being like, well, is she over Adelaide? Is she done because she's happy and singing? Does that mean that it's, you know, I didn't have to feel guilty for being happy because I knew that these women got it. These, this community was broken just like I was, but with them, I could feel normal in my brokenness. I was normal broken with these people. And I think there are so many resources out there, other, um, whether it's group therapy or finding a community online or a nonprofit that helps you connect with other people, UDN peer, for goodness sakes, the, all of these, mm -hmm. all of these, um, groups can help us feel normal in our brokenness, which I think so often is what we are craving. We are craving that community so that we find those people who get us, who understand us, who don't look at us like the Debbie Downer of the group because of whatever we are going through. And, and that I think is where we can find those initial sources of happiness. Those initial moments where we're okay, being okay is in that community and in sharing our journeys. Beautiful. I loved that part of the book, hearing about the retreat and just hearing <laughs> that now. It sounds like it was such a powerful experience. It was. Yeah. Um, so I know many undiagnosed patients feel as if their body has betrayed them. Do you have any um, thoughts, insight, tips on how to process body betrayal in a healthy way? Um, I, so here I think is where there has to be a sort of acceptance that we come to. And this was not easy for me. I really struggled accepting Adelaide as the person that she was, as the person she was born to be. Look, now we know that because of this particular gene, she was always meant to be who she was. There wasn't something wrong with her. This was the way that she was made. And do I wish that she was made to live a longer, less um, traumatic life? Yes, absolutely. But that wasn't who she was. And that was something I struggled with for years to accept. Um, interestingly, my husband accepted all of that much sooner than I did. Um, and I, I almost think that it's because he just didn't think too much about it, that he sort of allowed himself to be in the present and to enjoy the moments that we had more. And I respect that and I appreciate that. I also think often as primary caregivers or as the person living it out, that is not always something we don't always, living in the present in that way is feels like a privilege. 
Um, mm -hmm. I'm constantly assessing, I was constantly assessing um, what appointments were coming in the future, what different med changes we might need to try, thinking about the past and what had worked and what had hadn't, counting the seizures, all of the things. Um, for me, I finally started moving toward acceptance um, probably within the last year of her life as I, as she really started to deteriorate. And for me, that came from a place of accepting that there was nothing I could do to make it better. Mm -hmm. That my goal was now to find ways to keep her comfortable and to keep her happy and that I could fight for those things and just love her as she was. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that it's still something that I struggle with yes. even now. I don't, I don't know that I have that quite figured out when it is your body or your loved one's body that is betraying you. Um, I would love to hear what you you feel on that, Kim, and any strategies or tips that you have. Absolutely. Well, I just want to thank you um, for your rawness and vulnerability and sharing um, how you process that. And what I'm hearing is like acceptance can be messy, right? When we oftentimes many people think of the five stages of grief by Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Mm -hmm. um, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and um, acceptance. And we know that, right, that acceptance is not being okay with the situation, with loss. It's not that. It's It sounds like, Kelly, that you were accepting come, and still coming to a place of acceptance. It's an ongoing journey of that this happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I appreciate hearing that, that this, another reminder, right, that grief has no timeline. Yeah. And we don't just move through these stages or emotions, um, phases, whatever you want to call it in a linear way. And we, um, oscillate. Yeah. I call and it, um, the chicken dance. <laughs> I loved, I loved that, um, metaphor. <laughs> It was because when Adelaide was alive, I felt like it was always two steps forward, one step back, three steps back, one step forward. And then it was actually another medically complex friend of mine who, when I was going through grief, she was like, Kelly, you know, this dance, you mm -hmm. have, you have d worked these steps over and over again with Adelaide. Now you just have to do it by yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I like doing it better with Adelaide, doing it on my own really sucks, but, um, but it is, it's, it's not linear. Nothing about grief, whatever we are grieving is linear. I, I find that I have some days where I can accept that Adelaide was made as she was. And then other days where I'm just furious that that was the hand she was dealt. Yes. Yes. And normalizing what you're doing here is normalizing that anger can come up mm -hmm. over and over again, right? Over days or weeks or months or maybe years. Um, and so some of the strategies and grief tools that I often work with with my own clients um, really involve grounding, right? Allowing ourselves the gift of the present moment when it feels impossible um, because so much of grief is living in the past and yearning to be with our person our child again or you know the worries anxieties of what this what a future looks like without mm -hmm. our loved one um and so really um utilizing some mindfulness-based interventions whether that's through um, deep breathing breathing exercises meditation physical movement right when we allow ourselves to just move our bodies like you were saying during the retreat you all started dancing the backstreet boys right like that <laughs> makes sense because you were allowing the grief to move through your body mm -hmm. and dancing 
you know, we're using our body. So we're not as much in our heads and it just is such a um, natural way to practice mindfulness and being fully present. I love that. It gives, um, I guess I hadn't really connected the dance piece of it, but it um, fully justifies my um, kitchen dance parties that I try and instill with my children. Although now my son is 11 and he rolls his eyes at me, but Anessa will still dance with me. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> You know, it can be like, it's good, it's good for your again. brain, Jackson. You have to do it for your brain. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I still yeah. don't think that'll convince him, but no, like maybe, him. maybe not. He might be a little embarrassed still, um, <laughs> just developmentally appropriate. <laughs> um, yeah. So you've mentioned your children, um, Jackson and Anessa. Mm -hmm. Um, how have you supported them? Um, first Jackson during Adelaide's illness and, and her decline and eventual passing and also just supporting them through their individual and collective grief journeys. Yeah. So Jackson, so I, as I mentioned, my mother is a mental health therapist. I have been in and out of therapy since I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, so that has always just been something that was, um, valued in, in my life. And, so we realized pretty early on that Jackson was going to need someone to talk to. So he is a very typical eldest child. He is so well behaved and obedient and um, really wants, he doesn't want to rock the boat. He doesn't want to upset anyone. And so he refused to talk about any of his difficult emotions with me or his father because mm -hmm. he didn't want to upset us. This was both um, before Adelaide passed away and, and definitely afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, but he would talk with a therapist. We called it his feelings doctor and he would go and he could just sort of let it all out to this person through play and games. And, and that gave him an outlet for a lot of those emotions that didn't cover it. I mean, it was certainly during Adelaide's life on average, we spent one week in the hospital and it was always me who was in the hospital and his father worked nights. And so Jackson was often for a while, it would be babysitters or family friends. We didn't have family who lived anywhere near us mm -hmm. um, who would come over and um, or he would go home with different friends after school and then someone would pick him up and bring him home. And and it wasn't working anymore. He was really struggling. He was jealous. How come Adelaide gets to have you in the hospital? How come she can't have a babysitter in the hospital? And how do you explain that to a five or six-year-old? Um, so we started in um, doing sleepovers. We essentially, we had very dear friends that we had made. And they set up essentially what was Jackson's room in their house. Their guest bedroom became Jackson's room. And they would pick him up and it allowed him some normalcy. He always knew if we were in the hospital, who was picking him up. Mm -hmm. He always knew he had a safe space with this family and they became like a second family, another mom and dad. And, um, and that, that helped significantly sort of so that he, um, even in the disruption of our lives, he could find routine, mm -hmm. um, after Adelaide passed away, look, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. He had a really, really hard time. And I think that, um, people like to say that kids are resilient and they may be resilient as kids because they push everything down and, and they live in the moment. And so they, they tend to not live in the past or live in the future. They are in the moment. They have very little control over their lives. But resilient kids do not necessarily turn into resilient adults unless they are provided with the tools that they need to process those emotions. So we certainly continued Jackson in therapy. Um, he has more empathy in his pinky finger than most adults have in their entire bodies. And I think that's super common of um, with siblings of medically complex or disabled mm -hmm. um, kiddos and he 
had big emotions and he was afraid of dying and major anxiety. His grades started suffering at school and um, he stopped wanting to participate in his, the activities. I mean, he was essentially, you know, nine, 10 years old and we were seeing signs of depression and it was really scary. It was, yeah. um, and he wouldn't talk to us about it. It took finding the right therapist. It took working with his teachers. We were so fortunate. His fifth grade teacher had grief training, um, which was incredible. So she would, she was comfortable. If he was isolating himself on the playground, she would go and sit with him and talk to him about it. She was witnessing his grief triggers in the classroom, which was usually anything having to do with like a timed test. And she would work with him or give him extra time. And so we were able to find these different ways to support his anxiety, to support his insecurity and his emotional um, uh, instability. And by the end of, so Adelaide passed away when he was in second grade. Mm -hmm. And by the end of fifth grade, he had been cast as a lead in the school show. He was um, tried a new sport. He had a solid group of friends. And so it was three years of, of struggling. And, and I look at myself and I struggled too for about, mm -hmm. you know, a solid, I mean, three years easy. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem wild to me that he had a hard time for that long as well and I don't think that we should try and rush children through their grieving process just as we shouldn't uh, rush adults through that process. Um, Anessa came to us uh, two years after Adelaide had passed away. Mm -hmm. um, she is a child so she was two and a half she has her own trauma from her life before and we are navigating that um but she would say like she you ask her about her family and she talks about Jackson and she talks about Adelaide and um she can little kids can be um it, it, a little black and white in terms of their vocabulary. And it's also, we had worked with a social worker when Adelaide was dying and had been instructed that when we were talking to Jackson about Adelaide dying, that we specifically use the D word. Adelaide is dying. Adelaide is dead. And that that was really important because saying that someone has moved on, saying that they're, they've passed away, those are very ambiguous terms and they feel more polite for adults, but for children, they're confusing. So that's the language that we used with Jackson. And that is the language that we use with Anessa. And it's um, sometimes she gets confused and she'll be like, wait, is Adelaide in your tummy? And I'm like, nope, Adelaide is in my tummy. She used to be, she was in my tummy, but she's not there anymore. She's like, yeah, that's right. Adelaide's dead. And I'm like, yep, she sure is. And to anyone else, <laughs> it sounds just like probably a sucker punch. But for us, I'm like, yeah, that's right. Adelaide's dead. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we have her pictures up all over the house. And whenever she sees a ladybug, um, which was is our symbol for Adelaide, she always points it out to me. We have a wind chime on our back deck that someone gave to us after Adelaide passed away. And I hung it up and I told her that every time she hears it, that that's Adelaide saying hi to us. And so when we walk out our back door to go to school or to come back and she hears the wind chime, she says, hi, Adelaide. She's mommy Adelaide saying hi to us today and I'm like yep she sure is and so there are beautiful ways that we can integrate and and help our children understand and sometimes it's beautiful like saying hello to a wind chime and sometimes it's really hard like seeing your kids struggle in school and have a hard time making friends um and everything in between and I, I think the the most important piece is just to give our try and teach our kids the tools that they need to help process in their own time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It looks like, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, you're both, you and Miguel are doing a wonderful job supporting Jackson and Anessa. Um, it looks like we have some questions. Yeah. 
Um, so Tasha um, says, Kelly has shared that her and Miguel donated her body to UDN, so Adelaide's body, and recently had found an identified gene. How did you coordinate that logistically? When did you decide that? And were you and Miguel on the same page from the beginning of those discussions? Yeah, we, um, so we were absolutely on the same page. Um, those discussions started when we entered, um, when we brought hospice services in to our home um, and started thinking about end of life and what that was going to look like and contacting a funeral home. So I contacted our Duke site for UDN and told them that we wanted, so we donated her brain um, because we knew that that was the origin of it, but if there was something we didn't know, like maybe there was a mosaicism and it was just a gene in her brain, whatever the cause, everything pointed to whatever it was, it was something in her brain. So um, Duke, we put Duke in touch with our hospital where Adelaide was cared for and they helped coordinate that. Um, it was still... Um, sort of getting into the nitty gritty details here. After Adelaide passed away, I called her uh, neurologist um, who, and this is one o'clock in the morning, um, who alerted the hospital. Um, and we already had it all worked out with the funeral home. So when the um, transportation arrived at our house, which was hours after she passed away, um, they took her body to Rush Medical Center where they took her brain and put it on ice. And it was eventually um, Duke. I don't think it was sent to Duke specifically, or maybe it was, maybe they forwarded it to Baylor or whatever um, medical center it was that was doing the actual research. Um, and then it still took two years <laughs> before we, and part of that was the pandemic, um, but research moved slowly when you're dealing with um, research studies and not commercial medicine. So um, it still took a long time. I'm incredibly grateful that that is something that we chose to do. And um, and I know that I believe we actually still have some of her brain left. So if it, it needs to be used for anything else, um, research is just, it's always been so important to our family. It is um, you know, I'm on the board of Cure Epilepsy, which is, does epilepsy research. Um, science couldn't save my daughter, but maybe my daughter's brain can save someone else in the research that is being done there. And in that way, it doesn't make it worthwhile. It doesn't, the sacrifice that my daughter made with her life, it doesn't, but I can, I can make some meaning come out of that. I can make some value come out of that and that um, it helps. Thank you. Um, from Nicole Patrick, my daughter is also a UDN participant who passed away before diagnosis. We are three years out now and still no diagnosis. How did you navigate that space when you had no diagnosis still? And how did you approach the, how did she pass question? Uh, um, I think because she had been undiagnosed for such a long time, her entire life. And then, um, her, I, I don't think I ever thought that we were going to get a diagnosis. I was actually kind of surprised when we did, I had settled into a place of just feeling like that wasn't going to happen, which was scary because, I, we knew it was probably genetic and was this something that my son was going to have to worry about with his children? Um, I, that said, I kept checking in with our, our genetic counselor at, um, at the UDN at Duke and just following up and checking in and finding out what was, you know, were there any other tests? What was, what was the status of, of what we were waiting for? Um, I, what was the other part of that question? The, um, oh, how did she pass? Mm -hmm. um, I would tell, so we did know that it was a neurodegenerative disorder, but we didn't know what the name of it was. So I typically tell people that she passed away 
um, due to complications from epilepsy and an undiagnosed neurodegenerative disorder. Um, the reality was that her body just got weaker and weaker and she couldn't breathe and then she stopped breathing. And that was that. Was that. Um, so that was, I, I compiled her symptoms, which is what I had done her entire life. When people would ask me what was wrong, I would give them a laundry list of symptoms and tell them we didn't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. Um, from Kelly Coleman, thank you for being here and for your book. I have a son with multiple disabilities and have many friends whose kids have various disabilities, some of which impact life expectancy for the children. For close friends, is it a welcome conversation if I ask about life expectancy and how they are doing with that, or best to wait until they bring it up? We're all in the rare disease parenting boat, but the journey is so different for everyone. So my advice here is that you have to sort of feel it out with the person. I think that that's such an individual, um, an individual question. I have absolutely asked that to certain people um, that I felt close enough to, and always with the caveat of, we don't have to talk about this if you don't want to. Um, for me, if that question is going to be asked, um, I want it to be less about um, sort of like a, a, a morbidity around how short Adelaide's life was going to be and more around how are you handling that? Like if someone is going to ask that question, I hope that it comes from a place of, you know, how, how are you emotionally handling that? How is your family? How are you, are you preparing for that in some way? Um, and from a place of support and not a place of curiosity or a place of wanting to educate yourself because you are in a similar position and you have questions about how other people manage that, um, if that makes sense. Do you have any uh, anything else to add there, Kim? Sure, yes. What I'm hearing from you, Kelly, is, um, you know, as the parent going through this, right, that you're looking for support and not wanting to be in that role of educator mm -hmm. to all of your family and friends all of the time, maybe some of the time, right? Um, but that, you know, you are entitled to just be a mom who's a caregiver to a child with an undiagnosed disease who's struggling. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? Yeah, you did. <laughs> Um, from Daniel DeFabio, I wonder if you can talk about grief triggers and mm. calendar dates. I also lost a child to a rare disease. I imagine sometimes an anniversary or holiday triggers hard times. And then sometimes the trigger is something entirely unpredictable. Do you find there are ways to brace for the predictable ones? Yes. Yes. So in my experience, you talk about like the holidays and those anniversaries, the death anniversary or the anniversary of a, um, a diagnosis or birthdays, all of these things, they freaking suck. Um, in fact, I, it is the shortest chapter in my book and I wanted it to just say they really, really suck. I'm so sorry. And my publisher said, no, you actually have to write a chapter about it. Um, <laughs> the, um, what I have discovered is that the anticipation of the dates is far worse than the dates themselves. Um, we place a lot of meaning on 24 hours and they are really just that. They are 24 hours. What helps me is um, planning for them as much in advance as I can. So on Adelaide's birthday, um, if it is on a weekend, we have a birthday party on her actual birthday. Um, even though she's gone, we throw a birthday party. We invite kids from the neighborhood or family friends who knew her. We have cake. We do a ladybug release. There's like a craft for the kids. And um, it's 
just like a little happy celebration and a day of recognition and, and, and happiness. I allow the death anniversary to be as uncomfortable and sad as I need it to be. And I so kind of grant myself that day. We now have a tradition as a family where we go to a sunflower farm that's about an hour and a half from our house. Um, sunflowers have zero meaning to me in terms of Adelaide. There is no connection, but um, she passed away in October and it's sunflower season and um, it's far away. It gets us out of the house. It gets us outside walking around. We'll go even if it's raining. We get to come home with beautiful flowers and it's an activity that eats up a majority of the day. Um, on the first anniversary of Adelaide's passing, I knew that it was going to be really, really difficult. And um, my husband and I grieve so drastically differently that it was not, um, I knew he was not going to be a support for me. He preferred to grieve alone. He didn't really know what to do with me. He never ever made me feel bad for expressing my grief and having moments where I was collapsed on the floor. Never did he try and push me to get over anything or um, to hide my grief. He was always very supportive in that way, but he was not someone who was going to come and hold my hand. Knowing that when it came to that first anniversary or any day that I can see coming up that is, is going to be particularly difficult, I outsource that. So I think we put a whole lot of responsibility on our romantic relationships to be the end all be all of all of the emotional support in our lives. And I call BS on that. Um, mm -hmm. If your sink is broken and your partner can't fix it, you don't get mad at them. You call a plumber. So let's treat some of our emotional needs the same way. I know that Miguel, my husband, is not going to hold my hand and ugly cry with me. So on the one year anniversary of Adelaide's passing, I called in my best friend from Chicago who knew and loved Adelaide, who was there with us through everything. And she ugly cried in bed with me and held me while I was hysterically sobbing. And then she started cracking jokes at Miguel's expense. And then we watched like a binge watched Schitt's Creek. And it was just perfect and lovely and everything I needed and not something that Miguel could give me. And that is okay. So I think when you know that those triggers are coming, you those days, those dates, giving your, trying to plan for them as much as you can so that it just doesn't feel like this 24 hours of emptiness um, because you're going to be a mess or you're not. Sometimes you're going to be okay. You know, it's interesting as we go to the sunflower fields and I give myself the, her death anniversary day to like, be depressed and to miss her and to sit in those dark feelings. Um, but it's a lot of times it's Miguel who is in tears while we're walking around the sunflower fields and not me. And um, I don't know, you just never know how it's going to hit you. That's so true. Thank you. We have four more questions and about all right. I'm going to try and be quick. Seven minutes. No, you're doing great. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so this is from an anonymous attendee. There are a few authors who have written about the experience of grief during the funeral and death ritual time frame. What advice do you have for parents in getting through that period of time or thinking ahead about the preparing for the funeral and death rituals? Well, I would say try and plan for as much of it as you can while your person is alive. Um, because or outsource it, or find someone who can just take it off your plate and do it for you. People are constantly asking what they can do to help. That is something that they can do to help. Um, our We were very lucky, our funeral director, our funeral home that we worked with really did a lot of that work for us. And we just had to answer simple questions. Um, I'm gonna be really honest. I don't remember a lot from that really about like two weeks after she died. Um, my memory is pretty dark, um, which is a pretty uh, common trauma response. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember who was at her funeral. 
Uh, I have a guest book. I, I did have a guest book so because I had been warned that I probably wouldn't remember and I would want to know who was there. So we did, we had a guest book. Um, I think the biggest thing is to just give yourself grace because you, you can't emotionally prepare. You can get as many of the logistics down as possible, but um, you just kind of have to, like in those, you just have to let it be. It, it's going to be what it is and um, and find a way to be okay with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks, Kelly. Um, from Nicole Patrick, I have another kind of practical question. I also have an entire book written about Felicity's journey. It's sitting on my computer and I'd love to get it out. Do you have any advice on how to go about that? Um, absolutely. Uh, so I, well, I would recommend going the self-publishing route. I... I cannot tell, like, I, tr I tried to get a version of Adelaide's story out and um, was just told over and over again that no one wants to read about a dead kid. And that hurts because it's my kid. Um, and I, you know, we know that there are so many people out there who can relate to a lot of this, but the publishing world is pretty harsh in that. Even in getting my book, Normal Broken, out there, I was told, um, or my my agent was told we wish that she had was coming to this from like spousal loss instead of child loss child loss is too uncomfortable um unfortunately that is the harsh reality of the publishing world so in terms of getting that out there i i recommend going the self-publishing route and um there are some really great avenues out there um, I've not gone that route, so I can't recommend any specifically, um, but that is probably the fastest and easiest way to actually get something out into the world about your child's life. Thank you. And from Bud Hager, um, he writes, you've written and spoken about comparative grief and its detrimental effect on individual and community healing. Can you speak to a, why you believe it persists in communities centered around grieving, and B, how do you respond when someone sizes you up in grief? Oh, bud. Um, so this sort of goes into what I was just talking about, this idea. I think um, I low, like this, we, we have this urge, this need to compare our experiences, to compete with other people. And we see it in the disability world. We see it in grief. Um, this idea, sort of looking at it from a grief place that like child loss is the holy grail of grief. Some people call it the grief Olympics. And I say BS, um, loss is loss is loss. Your disability is the same as someone else's disability. There's a quote by Mark Twain where he says, you know, the loss of a child's toy is the same as a king's crown. And um, they are losses of the same size. And so to, to that individual person. So to compare um, our loss, our disabilities, our grief with someone else's, it doesn't do us any good. Um, because whether we are saying, well, my grief is worse than them. So then you're putting someone else's experience down that doesn't benefit them. Or if you are saying yours, your experience is less than someone else's, then that, then that you're not doing yourself any, any service by, um, by devalue, devaluing your own experience, your grief, your disability is um, affects you the way it affects you. And we don't have to, um, it, it, there is, we don't have to compare it with anyone else's. It's, it's not healthy. We just need to sit with our disability, to sit with our grief and then sit with anyone else's and just be there for each other because Anything else is not helpful to us. It's not helpful to them. We are all equal 
in this game. There is no one, um, the second that we start comparing and contrasting, um, it's wasted energy. And I think we would agree that we all have very limited energy to begin with. I just want to um, say thank you so much, Kelly, for you just being open, honest, completely vulnerable. I know that this is from the number of questions that were posted about an uncomfortable topic that, um, you know, this is very helpful. And I just want to thank uh, Kim for asking uh, very thought-provoking uh, questions. And uh, before we go, Kelly, can you share where um, they can get the book and also about your blog? Yeah, absolutely. So the book is available everywhere books are sold, Amazon, Bookshop, your local bookstore. Um, you can request it at your library uh, if they don't have it already. And then my, oh, it's also available as an audiobook. You can listen to it on Audible um, or any, any other library consortium. Uh, and my blog Inchstones is, um, you can reach it at, uh, inchstonesbykc.com. I am also on Substack and you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook. I also post the blog there and that is at Kelly GC411. Thank you so much. And, uh, thank you to all those who uh, attended this event. Yes, everyone thank have you all thank so you. so much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Kim. This was thank just you. so thank lovely. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Paul. All right, love you. <laughs> Bye. See you soon. Yes, I hope so. And keep me posted. I'll help you get. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.